Yeah, we are about to start now. Katrin Jakobsdottir, Prime Minister of Iceland. Dear Elisa Wright, First Lady of Iceland. Dear Vigdis Fimbogadottir, former President of Iceland. Dear honorable guests, colleagues, friends. Good evening and a warm welcome to Verjold, whose Vigdis are in translation, the House of Vigdis, named after the first democratically elected head of state, and also the UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Languages, who I believe has been an inspiration and role model for many of us here. My name is Sofia Zakhova, and I'm the director of the Vigdis International Center for Multilingualism and Intercultural Understanding that is hosted here at the University of Iceland. And the center carries on the mission of Vigdis herself to promote multilingualism, learning languages, and translations as means for dialogue between cultures and nations. The center also is delighted to be the main supporter of the United Nations Decade of Indigenous Languages 2022-2032. And this decade, has the ambitious goal to safeguard, promote, and revitalize indigenous languages, and also uh, improve the lives of those who speak those languages. And Iceland might not be the first and most obvious place we think about when we say indigenous languages, right? But we believe that Iceland has a lot to contribute to such initiatives. Language has always been of a great significance to Icelandic society, and cultural expression through language has been embodied in the history of the country. And Iceland is offered seen, uh, often seen as bridge between cultures and continents, uh, also as a neutral territory where there is no language oppression, at least in terms of colonial heritage. But also during this decade, we hope that Iceland and Icelanders can also learn from indigenous communities and from indigenous leaders. And that's why we invited the participants in the Women Political Leaders Forum for a conversation with two women who are leaders and who are of indigenous and minority background. Our aim is to highlight inspiring achievements and also challenges that would hopefully foster engagement and common action in the spirit of this year's forum, Power Together for Cooperation. Our event, The Voices and Languages of Indigenous and Minority Communities, What Women Leaders Can Do, has been conceptualized as a platform of various perspectives that represent an intersection of historical legacies, human rights, gender equality, but also leadership at community, national, and international level. The Vigdis International Center co-organizes this event together with the Council of Women World Leaders, with whom we have been collaborating in the recent years on similar events. I would like to now invite Katrin Jakobsdottir, Prime Minister of Iceland and Chair of the Council of Women World Leaders to provide her opening remarks. Dear guests and dear Vitis, Okay, 
as a chair, as you allow me. I'm not Katrin Yakov's daughter. Uh, and I thank you for not silencing uh, the speakers. So first, thank you for being here. I think you being here and being allowed to be here only shows that the university and the House of Vigdis is a space for dialogue. I think it is important that all voices are heard in an engaging conversation and in a real dialogue. As organizer and host of this event, we do have a list of speakers which we want to hear. We don't want to silence or mute them. And we have two indigenous and minority women who are with us today, and we don't want to silence and spoil the event. They're here. This event is organized to hear also their voices and to hear the voices of all the others. If you want to engage on the, on the topic, of, of the forum, I will give you the floor as a chair when I give the floor for, for the audience. But I think you being here is also a good thing because we often hear that Iceland scores best in many, uh, in many indexes, uh, and this is far from the truth, and I think that you being here also means that there is a new generation, there are citizens who are conscious, who are critically engaged and are allowed to engage. But I also would like to ask you to allow our speakers to give their remarks and their speeches because you are now muting and silencing participants. Yes, and this, like the government muted and silenced the people who were the top. They cannot be here. We are, we are not representing, we are not representing the government. Yes, and she is invited. And the audience, I would request you because we have come here for a dialogue, a conversation. So you are currently walking into that space. If you could allow us to listen to her as an individual, not as a position, please. She is not here as an individual. She is here as the prime minister. She is an individual, a woman to us, please. She's not here as an individual, she's the Prime Minister. And also, she's representing all the powers that affected all these people, also people who belong to marginalized groups, ethnic minorities who were deported. Please, yeah, can you see the hypocrisy and the, just accept it and sometimes stand up and take a stance? The whole nation was outraged by this. She doesn't have to speak here. She doesn't have anything to add to what these wonderful thinkers and speakers and activists have to say. Yeah, probably you would allow a second opinion on that. Many people would like to hear the statement. And if you want, we can democratically vote and ask those who are present in the room if they want to hear Katrin Jakob's daughter speak. Please, we will do a democratic voting. Who would like to hear Katrin Jakob's daughter providing her opening remarks? Who would be against that? I'm not counting, but I see that the majority would like to hear our first speaker. As a chair of the meeting, I, would, I promise I would give you the floor when we have a time for discussion. But Ple all the refugees have no wife. Nobody gave them the wife to talk. Yes. They were just literally reported. Who is going to present them here? Who is going to talk for them? Yes, uh, I would like to then propose to you to come up with an event 
that that is a, a, an event about languages and dialogue among refugees communities. I think that's that's what we want to do here to be to be in me meaningful and engaged for yeah okay as a chair I would like to either ask you to be silent or leave the room please why, why doesn't she have to leave why doesn't the power have to leave and everything can continue <laughs> we just democratically voted I'm chair of the meeting so we voted that we want to hear our first opening remarks And you are and you are and you are silencing and not giving the floor to women who f who traveled all the way to here to speak about their own communities and their own leadership. It is a hypocrisy to say that. <laughs> she can just speak and we can continue. Yeah, we just voted the majority in this room. I'm chairing this assembly and the majority voted to listen to our first speaker. If you're not all right with that, I will have to ask you to leave or listen and then engage in a dialogue. Okay. Thank you for allowing that. Well, I don't ask permission to speak usually. I have never done that. I don't think any woman should have to ask permission to speak. And, and I have served in many roles, not just as a prime minister. And it's really something interesting about that, that always when women enter leadership roles, there are enough people in every sector that lash out to silence them. And this is just one of the many examples. But dear Vigdis and dear guests who actually came to participate in this event, thank you for being here. And I would like to welcome you all to this very important discussion on the voices and languages of indigenous and minority communities and what women leaders can actually do organized by this center with the Council of Women World Leaders. And I actually lead the Council of Women World Leaders now, the only organization of its kind in the world, dedicated to women heads, and state, heads of state or government, both current and former, founded by Vitis Fimbodotir, Mary Robinson, and Laura Lisfoot in 1996. We actually had a meeting today talking about what we can do to inspire more women to become leaders around the world. Because we actually have very fine examples of women leaders delivering better than their male counterparts. For example, when it comes to the pandemic and when we see how actually nations dealt with the pandemic, we saw actually that women leaders did better than men. We have many other examples, and I could also mention conflicts, which sadly are too many in the world, maybe in the same proportion as men leaders. So this is actually a sad fact, but the sad fact is also that we are still a great minority everywhere we go, be it in governments, parliaments, or even local municipalities. We had a recently our annual conference on gender equality where the main topic was women of different origin in Iceland. And the research show that it's not, gender equality is not just about being a woman. It's also about being a woman of different origin, of different ethnicity. We see that women who come to live in Iceland, uh, and uh, about 16% of the population in Iceland are immigrants. They have lower income. They are more likely to be living to be living in uh, rent, rental housing, and they also uh, do not get jobs that are really appropriate for their education. So this is what our researches show, and this is something that we need to do something about. We also see, because we're also talking about languages, that learning Icelandic is a uh, very important you know, actually creates a very important access to our society. We see that, that uh, people who come here and actually get Icelandic lessons, which should be free, which should be within working hours, they actually get better chances of, for example, having progress at work. If they're not deported. Um, so I think actually, for those of us interested in what we're talking about here, which is about gender equality and inclusivity in general, 
I think actually we need to have a special focus on these groups, not just women, but women inside the bubble women, and then I'm talking about women of different origin, but also other minority groups. Participation of all genders in policy making and decision making is hugely important. And we must also, as leaders and representatives of our governments, support various minority groups in our societies and listen to their grassroots organizations. And I think actually the best part of the annual conference on gender equality was the fact that we had not only researchers talking about foreign women, we had foreign women talking about their lives and sharing their experiences of moving to Iceland. So I think actually that indigenous, minority and immigrant voices in Vantage Post must be included in all our democratic processes. Our democracies will only be stronger and better for it. So thank you. I thank the majority of this room for having an interest in what I have to say, for what I have been fighting for as prime minister when it comes to gender equality. And I can agree with Sophia that we do not do everything well, but I think Iceland has a lot to share when it comes to gender equality. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Katrin, for your remarks and sharing your reflections, and especially for uh, pointing out that the conversation should be always uh, with the motto, nothing about us without us, right? Um, thank you for that. Now I would like to invite to the floor Laura Liswood, Secretary General of the Council of Women World Leaders, also to provide her opening remarks. Please, Laura. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for attending this. And we have been delighted to have uh, this be one of a series of events that when we have our annual meeting uh, here during the Women Political Leaders Forum that we are able to do a public event. And the council very much, uh, under the leadership of the chair, wants a public event to happen during this. And so I thank you, Chair. Uh, for ensuring that we were able to do that. And of course, I must thank President Vigdis, who helped co-found the Council of Women World Leaders 25 years ago. She had the vision to see that there was a need to bring women together uh, and to also reach out to men, because I knew that was also something that was very important to you. Council was formed 25 years ago. It started with uh, eight women presidents and prime ministers, and it is now 85 which sounds like a, a large number, but if you compare it to the number of men that have been presidents and prime ministers for the last 25 years, uh, we're, we're a small group in that sense. But it does allow us to speak in a, in a collective voice, and it, it does allow us to ensure that we have the diversity, uh, because the council members uh, uh, represent countries all over the world, and uh, they, are, they create a, a diverse uh, voice for uh, the people of their countries. And uh, we are just uh, very delighted, again, and that, I'll keep my remarks short, uh, because we have so many interesting people who are going to be participating in this. But I want to thank all of you for coming uh, to this event, and we're looking very much forward to the, uh, the dialogue that we'll hear and the diverse voices that we'll hear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. And now let me make an overview of the discussion. We will have two speakers, each of them having of about uh, 10 minutes. And uh, they, they have been both uh, involved in community and organizational leadership uh, and kindly agreed to share their reflections on how to make minority and indigenous communities' voices heard. In the second part, we will have a panel, um, and our two speakers will be joined by Eliza Reed, First Lady of Iceland, and Irina Bokova, Director General of UNESCO from 2009 to 2017. And then we will take uh, uh, questions and comments from the audience. 
Now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Sara Olswig, who is the International Chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, which is the indigenous people's organization that represents Inuit living in Chukotka, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. Olswig is a long-term human rights and indigenous people's rights defender and has previously served as a member of parliament in the Greenlandic and Danish parliaments and as vice premier and minister of social affairs, families, gender equality and justice in the government of Greenland. Sara, the floor is yours, please. Koyana? <laughs> I just wanted to say first in my own indigenous language, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, today on your focus on indigenous peoples as well as minorities and languages. And... Um, uh, it's uh, an honor for me to be here and speak uh, to you, excellences and audience. And uh, I had many uh, thoughts speak at the... Should I bring it up, maybe? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. 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 I had, of course, many thoughts now at the opening of, of this uh, event. And uh, one thought that struck me was that... Uh, uh, first of all, that I was quite much younger at that picture. <laughs> it was a picture that was taken uh, one of the first days after I was elected member of parliament in 2011. Uh, I always thought it was a little bit too, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, like it was uh, uh, done something about the picture. Uh, but it, I, I started thinking about also with the voices we heard from the back that the uh, as an indigenous uh, woman and someone who is very much um, always engaged in many different questions, uh, life has taken me through many different roles, both the role of being an activist, the role of being uh, an, a parliamentarian, a government member, uh, and now back into another kind of politics with the Inuit Circumpolar Council, which I have also worked for before I became a politician. And uh, there's so many things that can be said about uh, indigenous peoples and our languages. And I had to think very hard about which ones to draw up in a conversation, conversation like this. Um, I am en route to Egypt uh, to represent Inuit at the uh, COP27. And uh, I always feel a little bit um, uh, ambiguous about traveling so far away, spending a lot of time in a plane, emitting a lot of CO2 <laughs> to speak at a big conference. But I also know that if we don't go, when we represent peoples that are so few in numbers and whose voices are often drowned in a lot of other events and not least among the many, many powerful peoples and nations, if we don't go and we are not there, and we don't raise our voice, then of course we are not heard. So in all respect of everybody who wants to be heard, it is of course important to speak up and also be present. So I was very happy that I was actually in Iceland today <laughs> when I received the invitation for, for this event. Um, and I have chosen three things from the list of many, many, many things that you can talk about when we speak about languages. First of all, you know, with the international, international decade of indigenous languages, which has a very nice um, uh, motto kind of slogan, leaving no one behind, which we all know about, and no one outside. I think that is a very good uh, way of expressing and tying it to the whole world's agenda of a sustainable development and remembering those who are still there and not fully represented. Um, what is particularly important to say when we talk about indigenous peoples and uh, our 
right of self-determination, our inherent right of self-determination, which ties into so many aspects of our lives, including our identity, our culture, our languages, anything else that goes around, uh, 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 on around us, is that we are today recognized as peoples equal to all other peoples. That thing has stuck in my head because first time I came with ICC, with the Inuit Circumpolar Council, to a UN meeting was in 2005. I came with the organization as a young student um, to one of the last meetings in the uh, UN Working Group on the Draft Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was a meeting where I felt I could feel the air move. And it was because there was a debate about the S in peoples and the debate about where the apostrophe should be when we talk about indigenous peoples. And the voices of our people who stood up and kept fighting for that apostrophe to be in the right place and for the S to be included when we talk about indigenous peoples, it made the air move in the room, that beautiful room down in Geneva uh, that I will see again in a few weeks when we go back to the UN and have another fight for the UN to recognize that indigenous peoples should have a stronger position within the UN and its treaty bodies and all of the examinations about our human rights. And with that, what I'm trying to say, or I want to express, is that when we talk about indigenous peoples, and even when we talk about minorities, or other unjust uh, issues in the world, I will actually now tell you one of the recommendations that we are bringing to the UN uh, Climate Cup uh, in, in Egypt. My colleagues are already there bringing our recommendations. And it is that we urge everyone, all governments, to recognize the false dichotomy between what we call developed and developing countries. It only speaks to that inequity. It only speaks to a worldview when someone is in a lower hierarchy than others. And that is the constant struggle we also have as indigenous peoples because what often uh, is the case, and what the, the whole term indigenous peoples grew out of, is that we were the ones that did not obtain sovereignty or full self-determination when the world started to have decolonization processes after the Second World War. So for us, it is a constant struggle. And, and I have thought very much about, I was reminded again today of those different positions that you are in when you have that constant struggle, that you work and push the agenda, whether you are in government, whether you are in an NGO, an IPO, as we say, Indigenous Peoples Organization, that's what we want the UN to recognize in a few weeks. And when we, when we as citizens, as mothers and, and daughters, as partners to whomever we live with, have these struggles from day to day. Because what I also uh, wanted to say that indigenous peoples, we bring a diversity to the world. We, we make the world richer. We have also in UN um, uh, fora and in Egypt, we will repeat, that the fact that we have been able to sit at the table and, and take part in negotiations, bringing another worldview to the negotiations and dialogues between states and peoples, it has made stronger uh, results. Because we, who are often marginalized, whether it's because we are minorities or because we are viewed as peoples who don't have the same full sovereignty rights as other peoples because of our history. We often bring a more diverse and um, I would say colorful uh, perspective on the world to the, to the table. 
So it is a celebration to celebrate our languages. And I wanted to end on a personal note. Um, in Greenland, where I'm from, I, of course, represent Inuit from four different, very, 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 very different states. Inuit in Russia, Inuit in Alaska, Inuit in Canada, and Inuit in Greenland. In Greenland, we are in majority. We speak our own language, Galatlisut, as you heard in the beginning of my speech. But there's still a power relation that is different. It is still difficult for those who speak, only speak Galatlisut, our language, to go through an education, to get a job, or to be a citizen in a country uh, which is their own country. And it is also difficult for those who only speak Danish. Because we also live in a complex country where your identity can be questioned if you don't speak your indigenous language. So it is still a difficult atmosphere. It is still a difficult task that everybody has to fight hard to find a solution to. Today it's the 9th. On Monday, on the 7th, it was International Inuit Day. And International Inuit Day on the 7th of November uh, is celebrated because that is the day uh, Eben Hobson Sr., who founded our organization, Inuit Sunkapola Council, it was his birthday. And his vision of bringing Inuit together is one of the things that make us strong in our identity. It's one of the things that for 47 years that has now passed since he, he founded our organization in 1977 together with Inuit from Greenland and Canada and later Chukotkan Inuit joined us, uh, is based on one thing that he has said and we have highlighted and that is that although we are not a nation state, we constitute a nation. So to be able to understand the world in other ways than what we would call a Westphalian way, or in other ways that states would look at each other, that only is about what kind of sovereignty and state border we have, that is also something indigenous peoples bring to the table. Because for ex especially us Arctic indigenous peoples, what makes us, um, what brings us together is also that we live across borders. And we live across borders today that are more divisive and than, than divided than we had seen for some years. We were founded during the Cold War, but today it's unprecedented. And we have so much to fight for, especially for those of our peoples who have been suppressed the most. So on my personal experience is actually that I didn't speak our indigenous language. It wasn't the first language I learned. But I had some parents, a white mother, an Inuk father, who did, did, uh, went against the system. Because in the system in the 80s in Greenland, if you had a Danish or a white mother, you would automatically be put in a class that only speaks class in a school that only speaks Danish. But they demanded that I should be in the Galatlisut speaking class. And I learned my language from my fellow kids, from my friends. The first language, uh, the first word that my mother has told me that I learned, she also learned our language, is Ilailanga. Can I join? <laughs> So she tells me that I would use the word in the playground and by that learn the language and be able to join the Gadaltisut speaking class. And I have been forever grateful for my parents that they pushed for that and went against the system in a country that has been always about going against a system that we had adopted from the state that colonized us. And it is still so today. So the struggle continues. 
And as I know from so many other indigenous brothers and sisters around the world, it continues by us being proud of who we are, no matter who we are. It continues by us insisting on our place and voices uh, and seat being at the table. And it also comes with the perseverance that we have demonstrated in fighting for our rights as indigenous peoples through so many decades and on so many levels. So that will continue. And thank you so much for listening. Ruena. Kuyanak, this is the, the I, I hope I pronounce it correctly, the thank you in, in, in your language. Uh, thank you so much for bringing a global but also very personal perspective that means a lot to many of, of us, I think. And also for pointing out that maybe it's time to think beyond many dichotomies, uh, Western, not, not, not Western, and um, developed, non-developed. I think it's very important. Now I would like to invite our second speaker, Liliana Kovacheva, and I will say a few words about her. She holds a PhD in ethnology and is the first woman actually to hold such a degree from a Bulgarian academic institution. Um, she is also an author and has held different positions uh, in the Central Governmental Administration of Bulgaria and also was director of the Center for Educational Integration of Children and Students from Ethnic Minorities in Bulgaria. She is also a member of the International Roma Union that has a UN observer status. It's uh, an, organization, an umbrella organization. And she has contributed to the Council of Europe's curriculum portfolio for teaching of Romani. And I have asked Liliana, because we often, and I know many people, do not, a lot, uh, no, do not know a lot of Roma gypsies, but have certain ideas about the Roma. And they definitely fit with stereotypes about traveling, being colorful. So I asked her to bring a really very personal and a case study that, that just showing uh, a, very, a very powerful uh, women's solidarity from Bulgaria. And now the floor is yours, Liliana, please. Respected organizers, guests, and participants, allow me first of all to uh, thank uh, the organizers for the invitation and for giving me possibility to share with uh, you one case of successful activity of Romani women from Bulgaria. Let me introduce myself. I'm Liliana Kovacheva from Bulgaria. Romney by origin. I grew up uh, in a traditional Romani family in the community of Kustendil, a town situated in the southwest part of Bulgaria. After I finished my primary school in our Roman neighborhood, I had a big ambition to continue my education. But my parents didn't uh, not agree. They didn't not allow me to do so. This was uh, 50 years ago, and on that time, no girl of Romani origin had uh, done so. Only a few boys enrolled in a secondary school. After finishing their education at the age of 15, Roma girls were supposed to take care of the housework and were prepared to be married. For me, it was very difficult almost impossible to convince my parents to allow me to go to study together with the others, the non-Roma. Finally, I succeed to convince my parents. All our relatives were very unhappy and angry with my parents. When I finished my secondary education, 
and received my diploma, I had the ambition to enter university, and then my parents, parents supported me. I finished pedagogy at university, became a teacher, and was appointed to the school of my own Romani neighborhood. That's when the Roma from my neighborhood started to respect me, and I became a role model for their children. As a teacher, I was involved in many activities with the mothers of uh, my Romani students. We registered the association's mother. A few years later, our association was invited by the Foundation Gender Project in Bulgaria as a partner for the realization of a regional project called, called Romani Women Can Do It. During the realization of this project, we learned a lot from our partners. They were very experienced in the realization of projects and in capacity building. The duration of the project Romani Women Can Do It was three years and included Romani women from 13 countries in Eastern Central Europe, Bulgaria, Kosovo, Montenegro, Serbia, Macedonia, Moldova, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Romania, Albania, Croatia, Slovenia and Hungary. I'm going to present shortly uh, the project from Bulgaria. During the first year, we selected 15 ta towns in Bulgaria with a concentrated Roma community. For each town, we selected a Romani women as a coordinator whose responsibility was to select active women. Then the team of our project organized three focus groups in each neighborhood of women, men, and youth in order to identify the problems for this particular community. In the second year, we organized training for the women how to speak public with uh, confidence and arguments and to campaign in media. In the third year, the project team informed the political parties in Bulgaria about the projects, uh, about the project. We organized meetings and convinced the mainstream political parties to include Romani women in their list for the local elections about the municipality councils. The, the last year of the project coin, coincided uh, with the local elections in Bulgaria, so we organized political campaign for the women among the Roma community. I remember when I was at the meeting with Bulgarian politicians, I, uh, I was asked many times, why is this project so important to me? Then I answer it. Our team is part of regional project with participation of all nations which are signat signatures of Stability Pact in Southeast Europe. We, the women in civil society and in politics, demand and accept the responsibility to work together with representatives of our governments and in the international community towards lasting peace, good neighborly relations and stability for our individual countries, as well as for Southeastern Europe as a condition for further European integration. Women are the stakeholders and have a vital interest in peace prosperity and sustainable human development of the region, which cannot be achieved without the active participation of more than half of the population. At the end of the project, as a result of our campaign, 20 out of 25 Romani women were elected in the local, local municipality councils. As a conclusion, I can say that uh, when both Bulgarian and Romani women work together, the results are very impressive. They learn from each other, 
They get to know each other better, and of course understand that we have common problems and common goals, which are very important to mutual work and for successful integration of minority to the majority. 20 years later, I would like to see projects like Roman Women Can Do It uh, repeated because of the concrete, real, and sustainable results. The Romani women who were involved in this project are still active, and this makes me proud and happy. Thank you for your attention. Of Sastimi Pen, thank you very much. Uh, I think this is really a very impressive project. These women, I mean, uh, really from zero to 20 uh, members of uh, local uh, municipal councils was a very impressive uh, result. Uh, so thank you for sharing this, Liliana. Now I would like to invite uh, Eliza Reed and Irina Bokova to, uh, to join the panel discussion together with Sara and Liliana. No arrangements as you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would like to introduce the other two speakers. Um, Madam Eliza Wright is, Reed is the Icelandic First Lady, a position she defines as a quote, and this is a really favorite quote of mine, an incredibly weird job. Eliza is a journalist, editor, and co-founder of Iceland Writers Retreat. She is also United Nations Special Ambassador for Tourism and the Sustainable Development Goals. She has been active in promoting gender equality, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Her first book, Secrets of the Sprakar, Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World, was published this year. And I really highly recommend it to all of you who haven't read it. I understood that some of our foreign guests have already read it and discussed it with their book club in the US. Patricia, yes, lovely. <laughs> And um, Irina Bokova was the first woman to lead UNESCO as Director General of the organization for two consecutive terms from 2019 to 2017. She has held important executive and governance positions within the UN system and throughout her career has been actively engaged in international efforts to advocate quality education for all, gender equality, cultural dialogue, and scientific cooperation for sustainable development. Ms. Bokova has received state, state distinct, distinctions from countries across the world and was awarded also Dr. Honoris Causa from leading universities. And uh, on another note, I think for Iceland and for us, the hosts, the Vigdis International Center, um, her leadership was very important because due to her enormous support and fruitful collaboration during her tenure as UNESCO Director General, the Vigdis International Center for Multilingualism and Intercultural Understanding was set up as UNESCO Category 2 Center within the University of Iceland. So we are all thankful for, for this to Ms. Bokova. Um, I will join the our guests and speakers, and start with a, uh, <laughs> uh, with a question to Irina, Ms. Bokova. As I have already mentioned, uh, you have made gender equality your own personal priority and have diligently advocated for ensuring quality education for all. I would like to ask you what are the most important insights from your work when it comes to work with women of minority and indigenous background, and what are the major challenges that you see existing out there? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sophia. Thank you for a very kind uh, presentation. Um, 
I really came here uh, with uh, enormous pleasure, uh, delighted to be with Big Dis. Uh, UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for a number of years and a big supporter during my mandate. Thank you very much, Vigdis. I learned a lot from you. Uh, I learned a lot from you when we uh, speak about uh, leadership, um, when we speak about political courage, um, about uh, multiculturalism, about dialogue, um, uh, about human dignity, human rights, uh, because I think uh, here what is at stake is exactly it's about human dignity, about human rights, about social inclusion. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to be in the center in this fantastic building. I came here in 2014 when we launched the, uh, uh, the institute, but now I see that it has really developed as an important part of the uh, university, and I would like to congratulate also uh, the rector and all the, uh, the faculty. Um, you asked me a question uh, about uh, what are, from my point of view, the biggest uh, uh, challenges. Uh, first, let me say that um, we, we know more about uh, what brings um, quality of education. We know much more what brings social inclusion. We know much more uh, what is at stake when we speak about um, minorities and, and women. Uh, and I think uh, we speak about sustainable development agenda, we speak about uh, uh, the role of uh, the United Nations, uh, and uh, creating all this uh, ecosystem, it's not just one, one decision, it is not one uh, legislative fact, it's not one government decision, it is really creating the whole ecosystem which uh, creates the opportunities for uh, uh, indigenous representative of indigenous people, in this particular case, we ask me about women, which sometimes are more vulnerable uh, to that, uh, to be part of, of uh, uh, to give them the opportunity to be part of, of, this, uh, of this effort. Um, and uh, here languages play a hugely important role because we're speaking about languages. Um, languages uh, uh, is transmission, of, transmission of culture, Languages is access to knowledge. Uh, languages uh, is about sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Languages is the huge opportunity for you to develop your own uh, feelings. And I was really uh, very impressed uh, by, by what you were saying, your own experience mm -hmm. and, and the way it is. And uh, if we don't recognize this diversity of language, uh, give the opportunities, we will never uh, achieve a true uh, social inclusion um, and um, uh, and a true respect for, for diversity. Now, I have, uh, during my time as UNESCO, I have visited a number of uh, communities in different parts of the world. Uh, um, I have spoken, um, and we have, at, U at UNESCO, we have worked uh, in Central America for uh, not only translating textbooks, but creating the content of these textbooks, because it is not just translate from one language to another. It is really to have the local context, to have the local. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's, uh, I think it's, it's really focusing on, on what makes this inclusion work in full respect of the culture and the uh, identity of, of such communities. Thank you very much. Now I have a question to Eliza as a Canadian Icelandic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have been probably following uh, the developments in Canada related to indigenous communities, language loss, um, assimilation, cultural oppression, but also physical extinction. And uh, again, from the Canadian context, uh, Governor General Mary Simon, who is indigenous leader herself, has publicly stated that uh, indigenous languages, I, I quote, are marginalized all the time in Canada. Um, living in Iceland and being an Icelander also, you have observed the uh, policies, processes, and initiatives re related to language. Do you think that uh, any of uh, uh, the Icelandic experiences and initiatives are transferable or in a way useful mm -hmm. when it comes to language revitalization and development in, um, in regards to indigenous languages in Canada probably? Thank you very much for the question, and thank you very much for asking me to sit on this incredibly illustrious 
panel of people with wonderful speakers, and I'm so grateful to, to have been asked to participate. Um, yeah, so in, in Iceland, we have this phrase, Glöchta gests augath, a guest's eyes see more clearly. And I think as someone um, who has English as a first language, which is in, incredibly spoiled when you think of it, um, but who, who has spent most of my adult life uh, as an Icelander living in Iceland, learning the, the language, which is an ongoing process. Um, I, I, I often use this expression about the guest's eyes because, as you say, I, I, I see things about both as, a, as an immigrant, how, um, how easy or challenging it is to uh, learn a, a new and lesser spoken language, uh, but also, uh, also the importance of doing that. And, and, and I think it's, if I may say so, it's one of the things, you know, I feel as a, as a new Icelander, um, and I always speak of myself in the first person with Icelanders, that it's something that we deserve to be very proud of. If I put my hat on as a Canadian, which I also speak of myself in the first person as a Canadian, uh, we do have, uh, have um, a lot of, you know, oftentimes very shameful history when it comes to uh, Indigenous relations. And I, and I hope, and I see that from the outside, someone who hasn't lived in the country in, in, uh, in over 25 years, that, um, that we are, are, are working towards good reconciliation and, and the support of Indigenous languages is so important to that. Um, and, and I really enjoyed what Sarah said about indigenous peoples. If we look at, at um, the territory of Nunavut, for example, in Canada, which is majority uh, indigenous peoples, I believe it has 14 functioning languages within this, within this community. So um, also within Canada, this is a very, very diverse group. So what can, you know, I think um, any areas, any linguistic groups, we can very much learn from each other and exchange communications because we are all on the same page about how important this is. Now, uh, if I look at the Icelandic, Icelandic example, certainly when I, when I speak about, uh, about Iceland abroad, uh, some of the things in relation to our language that I like to highlight are you know, building on this, this long history that we're very proud of and combining it with, with modern technology. Um, because the, the future of language also lies in technology. And, uh, and we need to be able to communicate with devices. We need to be able to, to have, you know, the autocorrect when I type in Icelandic is very, very frustrating compared to when I type in English. And that, that does make a difference for, for young people today um, when, when we're communicating. And, and so there's these wonderful schemes to, uh, in, you know, encourage us to to develop voice recognition technology. Mm. And I know that my husband and I have both been an active part of this, maybe me especially, because I, I, I speak with uh, Icelandic with an accent, and it needs to understand my Icelandic as well, not just natively, uh, n natively spoken Icelandic. And, and I think it, it, that adds as well to this, uh, the discussion of, of what our prime minister said in her opening remarks, that when we're talking about language, when we're talking about uh, language as a tool for, for equality and all this, we need to be intersectional mm -hmm. in our approach. Um, and we can't be limiting that to, to certain groups. So I think that there is, there is a lot that we can be doing to learn from each other. And I think that what we have to offer here in Iceland are this technological approach. And I would say sort of, uh, and this is not to say that other languages don't have this, but I, I this sort of fun approach to language. You know, we have this committee mm -hmm. that brings new words into the language when we need it. And you can vote for word of the year <laughs> Um, on the national broadcaster, there's a big ceremony that, mm -hmm. you know, and there's new words that came in to do with um, being, feeling shame that you gave someone COVID, that we have a word for that in Icelandic <laughs> now. Um, in a more positive way, uh, you know, we have a word now for racial profiling, which we didn't have before. And that, you know, there's, there's lots of ways that that, that that helps the languages to grow as well as, as we adapt to, to modern times. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I have a question to you. I think you already mentioned, uh, of course, the cross-border aspect of the Inuit community. Uh, and I do know that, of course, Inuit communities and other indigenous communities suffered 
language oppression, loss of language that goes hand in hand with loss of identity. But I also know that uh, Greenland is often looked at um, uh, by other Inuit speakers as the best example. So I read about Canadian um, Inuit leaders coming to Greenland to, to learn more about the language development of policies. So I would uh, like to ask you to highlight what are these best practices that are maybe transferable uh, into Inuit context or beyond mm -hmm. that re are related to languages. And maybe what is the role of women as users or leaders in this process? Thank you. Well, I think that, as I mentioned, uh, in Greenland, the majority of us speak our indigenous language, mm -hmm. but as you say, it's not, that's not the case and has not always been the case in other, mm -hmm. uh, Inuit, uh, for other Inuit in Inuit Nunat. Um, and I can also add, I mean, if you go to Alaska, Inupiat, mm -hmm. which are the Inuit in the northern part of Alaska, we actually speak very similarly <laughs> Inu mm -hmm. uh, Inuit language. Whereas others, maybe in more inland mm -hmm. uh, areas of, for example, Canada, their Inuit language is quite different. So there's, there's an amazing uh, feeling of connectedness among our peoples, even mm -hmm. also to Russian Inuit, because a lot of our words are the same. Mm -hmm. And you, can, you get this feeling of, of we are not alone yeah. uh, in having this challenge of having been ma marginalized in many different ways. Um, we are uh, somewhat fortunate in Greenland that the way that colonization played out was in a way where even the colonizers learned our language. It was the tool for them to do their mission mm. uh, to Christen uh, Inuit that they met when they came. Um, but there was also a very, very clear shift, as I said, in the power relation between the two languages that are spoken mostly in Greenland, so Galatisut and Danish. And those power relations have, are still there. So, for example, I also work in academia. I'm doing a research project about security relations and foreign policy. Just as an example, we don't have the terms in Galatisut. Mm -hmm. And we use different terms mm. from person to person. Yeah. <laughs> so we need our language right. secretariat, mm -hmm. our official yeah. language Definitely. secretariat, yeah. to draw up, <laughs> draw up the to terms. Like even on the justice area, we don't have, uh, all have the very exact same terms that we use within our own justice system in Galatisut. Mm. So it really poses a challenge in, in securing justice equally uh, for everyone. Mm -hmm. So, and apart from the access, so that's also where the intersectionality comes in. Mm -hmm. So the efforts that there has been done in Greenland to have a national language secretariat, to have uh, councils that, that, that uh, work with these things professionally, uh, to have the ongoing debate about how important it is even if it's a challenge to write everything in Galashisut, there are often translations from the Danish version of the document that we work mm -hmm. with in government, for example. Even if it has been a translated document, to insist that it's the Galashisut version that is the main version. So it challenges ourselves to continuously uh, make it better and to continuously uh, have an effort to make sure that it's actually an understandable language. It's not always very understandable, <laughs> I must admit. I mean, uh, it's so, so, so difficult. When I was in government, one of the first things that we did on the social area was to actually hire a person who was specifically to sit and look off about uh, on the language. Mm -hmm. Because in our laws, we would use different words for the same thing. Imagine being a person who doesn't speak another language than Galashisut, and the social worker doesn't know what your rights are according to the law because the law says mm -hmm. two different things, or one law says one thing and another, another law says another thing. Mm -hmm. So it's also a recognition of, and, and you know, being willing to spend the resource to protect the language and be able, you know, and actually respect that this is the main mm -hmm. language. Yes, mm -hmm. it's difficult, it's costly, but it's the price of, of wanting to maintain the language and have a strong democracy based on your language. 
So I think those are some of the things that our fellow Inuit have looked to, but I also look in admiration to my fellow Inuit across the strait many, many times, because there's so many other things that they have maintained. You know, with the colonization and the mission, so many of our cultural traditions were mm -hmm. oppressed. Mm -hmm. And we, we lost many, many other things that are today. When I first time took a drum, I was shaking. I was afraid of the drum, mm -hmm. although it is my culture. Because for some reason it has been uh, a, a thing that was from the past, from someone else, who are actually my ancestors. Mm -hmm. But it, I have been, become so detached from it. And I know that's also what our youth is going through. You've mm -hmm. probably seen the revival of our Inuit mm -hmm. tattoos and mm -hmm. different kinds of insisting on maintaining a focus on decolonization. And I so much admire our youth to have the courage to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that across of Inuit Nunat, we uh, learn from each other on different sectors, and yes, language has been strong in Greenland, but with other things that are also tied to identity and language, other Inuit have had other uh, strengths that, that we may, may, may not have had. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Lily, a question to you. Uh, so in the European context, we often see phrases about the Roma as the largest European minority, but also the most marginalized. And uh, uh, my wish is to bring a positive note, a reversed uh, perspective, and look at the Roma minority as being transnational, thus uh, being transnational as something positive. So what would be the best examples you would like to highlight in terms of being transnational be, and women leadership, also in regards to maintaining culture and language across the continent or across borders. So what are like the assets and the, the best practices you, you can highlight? Uh, yeah, very often we hear such uh, negative stereotypes towards Roma people as a uh, minority, uh, who is uh, uh, inter uh, 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 it's not from one country but it's displayed yeah, in many international countries. yeah mm -hmm. uh, many times we hear that uh, there is uh, uh, Roma people who are uh, uh, uneducated there is uh, women girls who are married on 15. Some of these examples uh, used to, to have it uh, uh, very long ago, but now the situation is uh, changed. Mm. So um, uh, I like to break these stereotypes. Therefore, I did a research. Uh, how many uh, Roma uh, yachts Youth. Are with, mm -hmm. youth, are with uh, uh, high level educa mm -hmm. education and uh, has a uh, university degree. Mm -hmm. Came to know that uh, there are uh, a lot in Bulgaria, I'm speaking for Bulgaria now, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, girls, this, uh, this border for marriage mm -hmm. is changed. Now they go later for uh, for marriage, uh, and uh, from gender aspect, I wanted to see uh, who are more um, uh, educated, the girls or the boys. Uh, it it appears that the girls are with uh, high level uh, education, and mm -hmm. their number is uh, higher than men. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this we can uh, uh, see that uh, a lot of Romani uh, women are more active and visible in the international level. Miranda Volostranda from uh, uh, Finland, Helsinki from Finland, mm -hmm. she is the author of the 
textbooks for learning Romani language at school. Mm -hmm. She used to work uh, uh, many years in the Council of Europe mm -hmm. as a powerful uh, Romani women who work with the Romani women from other countries. Uh, in the European com uh, Commission, we can see that the, the first uh, representative in the EU Parliament are not Roma men, but Romanian women. <laughs> there is uh, Livia uh, Yaroka and uh, in the beginning Victoria Mogaci mm. from Hungary. Mm. So Romanian women are presented mm -hmm. in the EU Parliament. And uh, the, the situation I can say that is changed. Mm. Uh, we have uh, many uh, people who are already educated and prepared and most of them are women, which is very uh, uh, motivated for mm. the Roma women. In Bulgaria, we have a lot in the NGO sector, sector a lot of Romani women who lead organizations. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of them. Thank you. And just a, a, a final question to all of you before opening for uh, questions from the audience. Um, so we have a lot of uh, women from academia here, but also decision takers from different organizations, um, ambassadors, and so on. So what would be uh, your advice to those who take decisions when it comes to, uh, to minority and indigenous girls and women, how their voices can be heard better, but also go beyond hearing and listening and engaging in participation. So one piece of advice or lessons, lesson learned from your work that you think is quite universal for decision takers or people in power. And yeah, whoever <laughs> it's like. <laughs> I'll go first, but I'll try to be fast yeah. and, and not do it because I'm, uh, I'm not a politician or have a budget or a decision maker. <laughs> so I would say it, uh, the advice would be for the people who don't have that, um, uh, but who would like to be allies in this, is to, to uh, wear those sort of intersectionality, those diversity glasses all the time. So when we're, it's a small thing, you know, when we're giving speeches, are we being diverse in the people we are quoting in the speeches? Are we asking why we are doing the same speech again and we're not inviting other people to do it instead of us? And, uh, and, I, and I would just, um, yes, try to bear in mind the, the intersectionality dimension of it and for, for all of us in the way that we consume all kinds of culture and media and, and the way in which we speak. Thank you. Well, I will, I will probably take up from this and say that um, uh, and because we are at the conference uh, uh, here uh, on, on leadership, uh, leadership matters. I think you have to have political commitment. You have to, to lead. You have to um, know where you want to go and then to elaborate and to do all these ecosystems, uh, as I said. Uh, and leadership may be at a very high political level. It may be at the local level, uh, with the community level, but leadership matters. Uh, on, on a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, challenging situations uh, that we see today, uh, leadership is what can uh, really pull out and, and solve issues. Thank you. Mm. Lily, would you like to? I could say learning by doing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he, uh, the political parties, the mainstream political parties to, to open their parties for uh, women from minority uh, groups, at the least in order to, to represent their problems. Uh, because in uh, uh, 2019, in Bulgaria, there was a, a big scandal with our uh, uh, vice uh, premier who uh, delivered a head speech towards Roma nation uh, on the TV. And uh, I was uh, very, very disappointed that no one political party didn't uh, mm. uh, react on, on this action. It is very pity because mm. you are citizen in this, uh, mm. in this country and the prime, prime uh, 
uh, vice minister is not only for one part of the society, mm -hmm. he's for all mm -hmm. citizens. It was really uh, very unhappy. It, therefore, I think if there is a representative from the minority group, those are people who will take care of such uh, uh, things when something wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And block the rights of mm -hmm. minorities. Thank you, Lily. Yes, Sarah? and I think in, I mean, we, are, I, we look at the numbers in Greenland and it's the same. It's the same as you mentioned, that it is women taking higher education. Mm. Um, but it's not women who are in the most yeah. uh, highest leadership roles, especially in businesses. We are doing relatively well in politics, but still not nearly uh, equality in politics either. Mm. Still about a third are women. Um, if we look at the, uh, now there was recently new numbers again on, on our income and the inequality in our income even for those who have higher educations is still significantly <laughs> less than men. Um, we still have uh, over massive over-representation of women in regards to violence against women, in regards to abuse um, of, of women and girls. So it is truly, truly the intersectionality and it's truly also a matter of of uh, never, you know, ceasing to bring this to the attention of the, of everyone. Um, and another thing that I would also like to say is that um, we also have to be very, very specific in our uh, in how we view representativity. A lot of times we see a deficit-based approach to our peoples, uh, that we are the problem, or someone comes from outside to teach us <laughs> how to do things. Mm -hmm. And there comes again this uh, uh, recommendation we have to, 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 to recognize the false dichotomy of what is the real and then the other, or what is uh, the right world view and a not right world view or, or the, the main <laughs> the world view. <laughs> yeah. Because it really doesn't speak to bringing things together and having true representation. Uh, and, and it also creates the situation where we constantly are faced with the deficit-based approach that, that these people lack behind because they are this and that. Mm. And I think that the, that is a true challenge that especially is true a lot of times for women. I have definitely felt it many times in my different kinds of positions in politics and outside of politics. And um, we can't really stop to, to raise that attention to, to that. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now we can take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Shilpa. Uh, you on the third row, and uh, the third one will be there. Yeah. Shilpa, so, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is to you, Sarah. Uh, it is uh, just out of curiosity. We have a similar history. So I come from India, and uh, even after 76 years of independence, uh, I can still feel the scars of colonization, uh, wherein uh, my languages uh, in the country and the culture uh, uh, carry a stigma with it because uh, English was the, I mean, when I see myself, so, uh, myself also, I have been socialized and nurtured into that, so sent to a convent to learn English, to wear English and to talk English. So, uh, because there was the stigma which was associated with my own language, my own indigenous language. In your community, uh, was within your community a similar stigma? Like I know in the Romani, I'm uh, slightly familiar with that. That uh, it, it, they, they, there were quite a few who were who were embarrassed of carrying it with them. But was there a similar uh, understanding or, or a similar feeling or a narrative in your? Yes, and still today. Uh, 
Um, there are still things that happened during and after uh, during colonization and after the formal end of colonization that were uh, intended to teach us a different language, a different way of life, mm -hmm. even to the latest thing that has been been revealed is is that there was even efforts for us to not become too many. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a case in the 60s and 70s of mm -hmm. a policy mm -hmm. to insert IUDs mm -hmm. in women and girls. And right now in these years and months, the stories are being told mm -hmm. uh, about this happening to girls down to the age of 13, this happening as the numbers we have today to something that uh, is approximate half of all fertile women and girls. Um, and this happening often without their consent or their parents' consent, resulting in, for some, infertility. Um, so in my own family, we have uh, also are directly affected by another policy, which was about being legally fatherless. Uh, my adoptive father is legally fatherless. It was a policy that existed until the 60s in West Greenland, 70s in East Greenland, mostly Greenlandic women having children with mostly men coming from outside, but the man would not have a legal responsibility to the child. Mm -hmm. We have often looked at that with the perspective of the child's rights. We call it legally fatherless, so that we focus on the child. But what about the woman? And what also did it do to the view on women in our society? that there was these uh, policies of ins inserting IUDs. Um, and I watched a documentary about adoptions, not forceful adoptions, but adoptions that happened of Greenlandic children to, to Denmark. And one thing that was said really, really stuck to my mind, to this mother who finally met her child again after not seeing the child since the child was adopted and moved to Denmark to a new family, was that it was because uh, my brother-in-law, who is Danish, said that I had to give her up for adoption. And we did what the Danes told us to. Mm -hmm. So this is also about the power relation. Sure. When the teacher says to the kid, you have to go to the doctor because the doctor has something to tell you, mm -hmm. the kid goes to the doctor without asking. So in a colonized society, we see a power relation where it's difficult to explain, but it's a kind of a sense of authority and a, and a, a, and a relation to authorities that is different from what you see other places, I think, because I have not lived, <laughs> I'm not from another place, mm -hmm. but I recognize that even today. And it also comes through the language. So if, that's why we still have this huge inequity between those who speak either only Galatisut, speak are multilingual, and those who speak only Danish on so many different levels. And it is still a constant struggle. Mm -hmm. And there's still inequity. So it's um, 79 we had home rule, 2009 we had self-government. Uh, with the self-government agreement, we can freely initiate our constitutional preparation. We can decide to have a referendum to become independent. Um, but uh, these very nice words on paper, they don't take away these inequities that are incorporated into our society. And it takes struggles to, to get rid of it. Mm. Mm. There, there was a question on the third row. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pamela, I'm from the United States, and I'm here for the Women's Leader Conference. Um, and I thank those of you who have spoken um, today and throughout the course of the conference. My question um, is based on the knowledge that there is a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of knowledge and um, historical memory and leadership in this room. And it's I'm curious about the, myself, about the pace of change, and about the cadence of change. And I, I've worked um, 
I've been involved in global leadership and with women leaders for over three decades, and I have seen tremendous change in numbers, in substance, in quality, in acceptance, and some things stay the same, and, but so much progress has been made. And so I wonder, particularly from you, Irina Bokova, who's done so much and who's been involved in this for so long, but I'd love to hear from everybody as well, what lessons have we learned over time? Where has the change been made? What kinds of changes have you seen to be successful? And where do you think we can go in the future? Because you know, impatience is one of the greatest barriers mm -hmm. to making structural change. And I know that you've seen some of that in your career. Well, it's, it's a big question. Um, but um, I, what, what I have noticed uh, during the time when um, we were preparing Agenda 2030 for sustainable development, when we were looking on uh, uh, particularly on the goal on education uh, and then linking it also to gender equality, to girls, uh, uh, girls' education, uh, looking all across uh, uh, the, the different uh, aspects of, uh, of, of development and uh, what makes a society uh, inclusive and uh, what are the, the different elements uh, into this. Um, I think, uh, uh, as I said at the very beginning, I think we have gone so deep uh, into understanding uh, uh, what makes a society indeed, uh, uh, what is the equity in a society, what makes society uh, uh, inclusive and uh, and from that point of view, uh, I believe the questions about identities, the questions about culture, uh, come into the picture. Uh, the fact that we may have multiple identities uh, and at the same time uh, be uh, very active citizens in the country. And when you put um, uh, and I think um, here we are speaking uh, a lot about this. When you put in front of uh, of people with multiple identities, uh, the uh, the obligation to choose, mm. uh, I think it's so wrong, uh, and it's uh, it it really brings uh, then uh, violence in society. I also think that uh, we have to look at the um, the digital more uh, and the new technologies uh, a little bit deeper when we speak about that. Um, you brought uh, here uh, different aspects of the digital. Um, and I think uh, it's an incredible opportunity, of course, uh, to, to engage, to communicate, uh, to access to knowledge, uh, uh, everything. But if, uh, if we are not careful about what kind of content uh, we put there, uh, whether it's diverse content, uh, whether it's a content that is uh, um, taking care of, uh, of all our um, uh, here, uh, I would say, concerns, uh, and particularly, I'm very much worried nowadays, and it, it emerges after of all this uh, research that is being done, I'm very much worried about artificial intelligence, not I'm worried about it, it's an incredible, once again, opportunity to uh, solve issues of health, of uh, uh, sustainability, of climate, of everything, but it's very important what kind of algorithm we create, what we put in there whether we entrench stereotypes that we have now, uh, whether we entrench their biases mm. that we have now, uh, whether it's gender, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's language, diversity, and all this. Uh, and I think here technology is going much faster than we are uh, thinking about it, that we are uh, catching with it. Mm. Um, and I'm really worried about that. Uh, I'm very much worried because, in uh, particular, when it comes to women and gender, we are seeing already some not very positive examples into that, mm -hmm. uh, that all these biases are uh, entrenched there. Uh, and sometimes we didn't, don't even notice it mm -hmm. uh, because it's so subtle, it's so quickly, it's so uh, fastly moving. Uh, and I think from that point of view, uh, uh, diversity should be there also. Uh, respect should be there uh, also. Uh, if we have to look at it from that lens, that it's an incredible tool to protect our diversity mm -hmm. uh, and to pass it and not uh, just the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect, uh, as I said, um, uh, and without any type of uh, 
of biases and stereotyping of it. Uh, but I, I don't think we are there, and, and I, I'm very worried about that. Thank you. The question from the top. Who wants to engage <laughs> with an answer? Maybe Sarah, would you like to start? Oh, yes. Um, well, uh, I can't. I have seriously, I have not read the Icelandic news, uh, but I, I, I can imagine what it is about. Uh, I, I have not uh, followed the development here, so I'm not very, very sure what it is ex ex exactly about. I can just say that, that, in my opinion, we are living in a very, very worrying time. It's a worrying time because of the invasion of Ukraine, but it also is a worrying time because of the movement on a global level we see away from respect for diversity, away from um, seeing our differences as a strength. And that has been happening for a long time. We have felt it in Greenland and among Inuit. And now we are back in a situation that is even worse than we saw, for example, during the Cold War. Um, as I said, uh, our organization represents Inuit across the border also in Russia. Mm -hmm. And it is truly, truly a difficult task mm -hmm. to, to find a safe way ahead, mm -hmm. to continue to have that thin, thin thread of connection into our people uh, that who live under mm. completely different uh, uh, conditions than, than we do. And we have to be cautious of every single step we take in our organization, not for our own personal safety, but for our members in Russia's personal safety. Mm -hmm. So um, the times that we live in today where there has been a movement towards uh, uh, policies around the world that are uh, unjust, that are divisive, uh, that are bringing us in the wrong direction 
in regards to recognition of uh, uh, our equal worth, mm -hmm. uh, it is unfortunately now even worse <laughs> also for Arctic peoples. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's going to be fundamental that we, of course, it's, I mean, it, um, everybody wants to, the, the war to end, of course, but it's going to be fundamental that at some time when we reach the other side of, of the ter terrible uh, actions that are taking place today uh, is that we look inwards uh, in our own states in the Arctic because we have been at the forefront, especially those seven states that today uh, also are the ones that, that, that they call themselves like-minded uh, among the Arctic uh, states, look inwards and see where can we be the ones to further strengthen our democracies further strengthen uh, our recognition of diversity amongst the peoples that live in our states. Mm. Uh, and that is, again, back to the fundamental uh, uh, achievement we have from our indigenous leaders through years and decades of indigenous Inuit diplomacy on an arena mm -hmm. that we had to learn the skills to play on, mm -hmm. to be on in order for our peoples to be recognized. So I don't know if it answers your question, and I will go and check the news and see <laughs> what's going on in Iceland. Uh, I just want to say that I am deeply worried of not just what is going on in Ukraine, that is the most worrying thing right now, but there was a movement already in our world that was a, a worrisome, worrying movement. I'm also going to go soon to my hotel room and check the news from Alaska <laughs> because there's an election going on in the US mm. and in a few months ago the first indigenous Inuit woman was elected from Alaska to the Congress and she's now mm. running for having that term fully for the next four years so small good steps are happening and it has to continue so yeah yeah I think leadership is um, its something that, that I think about uh, a lot, and I, it's such a huge, huge question, but I think it addresses a theme maybe that has been common throughout the panelists this evening, and that has to do with diversity. Because the way that I define leadership or the way that I might want to be a leader in my sphere is maybe different than the way that you are doing it, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, but I think, uh, you know, we, we're brought here tonight uh, because the Reykjavik Global Forum has been taking place, because of the Congress of, of Women Leaders here, and, and we're very privileged um, uh, to be in the company. I, I feel very privileged to be in the company of, of such outstanding women leaders here. And, um, and I think that it has not only to do with uh, diversity of opinions and, and diversity of viewpoints, but leadership has the ability uh, to bring together and, and try to work with these diverse viewpoints and listen to them because uh, we can't be leaders in a vacuum either. And I think that, um, I think that, that, that is, a, that is a, a nuanced and, and you know, important skill set as well that we have to recognize that there's, there's, uh, it, it, there's give and take in everything. Thank you. So a final question from there. Thank you. A very short my name is Rosalia Pira. I am a member of the uh, Romanian Parliament Shura for an Affairs Committee, but I am a member of Hungarian minority from Romania. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I am sure that uh, you know about the initiative, what uh, was uh, needed uh, for uh, create a, a legal framework at the level of the European Union for the uh, national and linguistic minority. The name of the initiative was Minority Safety. The Minority Safe Pack um, uh, was signed by 1.2 million European citizens uh, from seven countries. So uh, the legal uh, uh, asking was uh, fulfilled to be discussed by the uh, European Commission. In 2020, uh, February, it was on the table of um, the uh, European Commission. And unfortunately, I have to say that till now, it doesn't have an answer. Uh, working in foreign affairs, um, uh, I have to underline that my 
perception is that uh, unfortunately um, uh, inside of European Union we cannot um, uh, have, uh, um, let's say, um, quotas like uh, minorities to create a, a legal framework for our uh, uh, rights to use our mother tongue, uh, to uh, protect our culture and so on and so on. Uh, and my question is, um, uh, if um, your Excellency see uh, any possibility that uh, the, uh, the UN or um, maybe um, uh, the UN with the European Union will, um, uh, will uh, make the steps to create a legal framework. Because, um, uh, because if you are a minority in a country, uh, we, uh, the Hungarian minority, are in the minority because we represent more than 5%. But we are a minority, so we have some laws in Romania, but if we don't put on the practice with the laws, they are just paper. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I would like to ask for just really very, very short feedback or comment, if you have any. Mm -hmm. I may uh, say something. Um, um, I, I don't know exactly about uh, the European Union, but uh, the Council of Europe uh, has a charter of, uh, of the rights of minorities, and now uh, Iceland is taking over the presidency of the Council of Europe. Uh, today uh, we were we were informed about that, and we know that uh, there is an important work. And uh, the Council of Europe is indeed this space with, uh, which uh, creates uh, uh, the the legal framework on many of these issues and the charter. On uh, uh, I, I probably don't know, uh, don't uh, quote specifically the name of it, but it is precisely about uh, uh, minorities' rights. Uh, and uh, maybe through the Council of Europe, uh, you may find some of the, the work of the Council of Europe, you may find some of the responses for this. Uh, as I said, I'm not, uh, I don't follow European Union on this particular, but I think European Union is not uh, uh, actually about creating this particular uh, key communautaire. It's rather the Council of Europe, and maybe you know more about it, mm -hmm. because you are working there with the, uh, with the Roma uh, languages. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Uh, the Council of Europe uh, did a lot uh, in uh, preserving and uh, protecting the minority rights. Mm -hmm. At least um, uh, I was in the working group for creating a portfolio uh, of Romani language. So they, they did a great job, uh, give possibility to all minorities to, uh, to, to create a portfolio for their own languages. But uh, here is, uh, as someone said, that uh, uh, sometimes the legislation is on a paper. They did a really great job, but the national government was supposed to have this process in their own countries. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean, this portfolio, the Ministry of Education, to offer to the, ch to the uh, teachers who are teaching uh, uh, minority languages to use this uh, a good instrument for them. Uh, somewhere is broken the chain, the chain. I don't know what is exactly the reason, but sometimes uh, on the international level there is a lot of uh, good uh, legislations who uh, give uh, uh, good uh, instructions. Uh, how to to be done? How to 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 put in the practice in the practice? But the national governments sometimes. Mm. The question is how to hold governments accountable, because they commit. Yeah, they course. sign yeah. documents, but yeah. this is the big question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there is no I'm way to push them and to, there is no legislation to obligate them. Yeah, with this question mark, <laughs> I would like to, <laughs> to thank our participants, but also all of you here who came, listened, engaged for, for being here. And let's continue thinking and working on common uh, initiatives, or each of us in, in our fields, and uh, just try to improve the the situation and let's get together also in a year 
to, to reflect on new achievements. All the new improvements. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>